with five seconds. He's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown, Carolina. Back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And it's Waller <laughs> with yes, a 54-yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it. Here's Kupak. Gives off to Amos. He's, he's good. good. He's, he's good. good. He's 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 Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio, he's going to take it for a touchdown. Are you kidding me? This is the Heel Tough Blog Podcast on Spreaker.com. Hey guys, and welcome to this edition of the Heel Tough Vlog Podcast. As you guys know, spring camp has begun, so it's time to turn to some of the big guns to learn about some of the best information that we can get coming out of spring camp. We've got two practices already in the books, so now it's time to talk to GoHeels.com's Lee Pace. We're bringing out the biggest gun to start out, and Lee... Um, first of all, when, when we talk about spring camp, I think this year, you know, we heard it last year that the vibe around the team was different, but it feels like this year it is just completely different than it's been in past years. Is that what you've seen over the first couple of days of uh, spring camp for the Tar Heels? Well, not only just with uh, spring ball, Anthony, but also just going back to uh, early January, the first team meeting that Mac Brown had with the squad, uh, where he introduced the entire staff that he hired. He introduced Brian Hess, who's a new strength and conditioning coach. And over the next couple of months, just the, uh, um, the standards that were set down, the difficulties of the strength and conditioning program, uh, the discipline, the structure, the attention to details, all those things, uh, uh, I think paid off in spades over six to eight weeks. And then it's, uh, it's kind of moved on into spring ball. Uh, you know, Mac has done some does a great job with, with the show part of the, uh, the showmanship of it. And he raised to have the band and the cheerleaders there on on Sunday for uh, the opening of, of spring practice. Uh, just a lot of people there, a lot of uh, Rams Club folks, uh, uh, recruits, former players, uh, friends of, of the program. Uh, There's just very much a you know kind of a, a festive celebratory atmosphere. And then they got down to business. Uh, they had two practices and we'll practice again tomorrow morning then for break for spring. Yeah, so you talked about it, you know, it started on Sunday with the first practice and so far, you know, the the battle that everybody's going to be keeping an eye on is quarterback, but there really is no separation from those three. When you look at those three quarterbacks, I mean, I think a lot of people think that talent's going to win out and Sam Howell's going to be the starter, but I mean, it, it, do you really think that Cade Fortin is just going to go away? And I, I think Jace Reuter also could throw a twist or two into that battle as well. I think the fact that both Fortin and Reuter have been in college for a year, they're a little older. Both of them look physically, particularly Reuter looks up physically much more impressive after a year and after these last two months in the, in the weight room. Um, I mean, gun to head right now, I would say one of those two kids would get the nod. It's, it's very, very difficult for a true freshman to start his very first college game without being redshirted. Uh, but who knows? I mean, Sam Howell is um, an enormously talented young man. Uh, uh, the, the good news is, I mean, I've gotten emails from people who say, who's got the edge? Who's got the edge? Honestly, I don't know who has the edge right now. And frankly, I don't care. All I know is that Carolina has three good quarterbacks. And this is a out, this is a wonderful problem to have, to have this much talent. And you look at Reuter and Fortin, what they did in very limited roles last year. You look at who, who Carolina had to beat to sign them. Um, yeah, they were not um, um, some Division three school that they had to be for, uh, for Ford and Reuter. They went up toe-to-toe with some of the best programs in the country to land these kids. So um, just 
it's going to be fun to watch it play out. And, and who takes snap against South Carolina on Labor Day weekend? I have no idea, but I know that um, they've got a lot of work, to, a lot of talent to work with in that position. One of the other interesting things that I saw on the first day of camp was how they laid out the offensive line. Now, we heard that Charlie Heck was going to stay at right tackle. He instead is going to move back, uh, or he's going to move to the blind side now, uh, which will be the left side. And then along the off- the rest of the offensive line, there were some changes that were made. J.J. McCargo moves to left guard. You got Nick Polino now at center, and then William Barnes and Jordan Tucker. First of all, you know, Nick Polino and J.J. McCargo, what do you think the reason is for that switch? Is it really just a size thing? Because it seems like Polino kind of fits that center size that you need a little bit better than McCargo. Well, number one, it's just an experiment. And I tweeted a photo out on Sunday, and you know, Will was careful to, to say this is just one day. So I'm not, I think it's interesting. I don't think we can draw any long-term conclusions. I, I do think McCargo has had an issue on his snapping hand. So I think that maybe was part of it. I also think that they just want to give uh, Polino a look there and just see if, you know, what he can do there. Uh, Mac Brown did make a point at one of his to the recruiting signing day press conferences how important the center position is. Um, it was very inconsistent last year. McCargo was out for uh, a handful of games for some off the field personal reasons. So Mac absolutely wants to get somebody experienced and solid, a leader, somebody who can make decisions. So I, I think they're just giving Polino a look there right now. We'll see you know, how it plays out over the next uh, four to five weeks. What, what is interesting is over on the right side, and, and, and last year, despite the 2-9 um, the season, one of the more interesting things for me was to watch the evolution of some very gifted and very enormous young offensive line, Jordan Tucker among them, William Barnes, um, Joshua Isudu, um, and, and Marcus McKeithen, and a couple others uh, that are really impressive physical specimens, good players, great work ethic, and to have Barnes and, and Tucker on that right side is a very imposing um, look over there, and, um, and you know, that's going to be another interesting storyline to watch play out. One of the other questions I think people would have on the offensive line is Billy Ross was a starter at right guard last year. Uh, Where is Billy? Is Billy still uh, fighting for a chance to start on the offensive line, or what do you see his role being? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and again, we're we're, we're two days into it, so uh, I I would caution anybody from drawing too many conclusions Mm -hmm. uh, in, in any position at this point. And then one of the other battles that a lot of people are talking about, and this one kind of crept up on me because I thought, you know, with K.J. Sales coming back, C.J. Cotman also coming back, I thought, you know, that number two cornerback position was really going to be in pretty decent shape. I don't know about great shape, but this is a position that I've seen both you and uh, Taylor Vipolis, a guy who does a great job covering the Tar Heels as well. You know, this is a position that really has become somewhat of a concern, you know, know why is that a concern at the moment and you know why do you think it's so important that they find that guy at that position well it, it always gets back to recruiting and, and how many good players do you have in the program and when MJ Stewart left after the 2017 season and, and in fact going into the 18th season Patrice Renee had not really stepped up you know Renee started the Georgia game at 16 um, had an unfortunate came there with a couple of PI calls and never regained his confidence. So it took him a, really a couple of years to bounce back from that, and, and he finally stepped forward in 18. And when, when K.J. Sales was hurt, they had some injury problems at the at position at the quarterback opposite Renee. As midseason evolved in uh, the Syracuse game, the uh, Virginia game, uh, just some of those games mid-year on, you could see that the opposing offense was targeting the side opposite to, uh, Patrice Renee. So it is incumbent that, you know, Dre Bly, who's now the quarterback's coach, that, that he developed Greg Rawls, KJ Sales, Cotman, Sops, Trey Shaw. Somebody has got to step up at that opposite position. Um, and, and that will be, you're right, that is a key storyline. And, um, you know, through, dude, through two days of practice, I have seen one of them. Um, really nothing to report to you there on that standpoint, but that is something that we'll be following up very closely as spring evolves. And then uh, one of the last storylines that we'll talk about is really Chaz Surratt 
with the move to outside linebacker. He's gotten some pretty rave reviews right now, which I guess was sort of expected if you knew the type of athlete that he was. But really with some of the reviews that we're hearing coming out, I mean, he's already starting to make a little bit of an impact and uh, an impression on the coaching staff. Is that kind of what you've seen out there so far? Well, you mentioned his athleticism. I mean, it was clear watching him run the football. I remember a couple of plays against Old Dominion um, a couple of years ago, a play against Duke, um, 2017 season. I mean, he is very gifted athletically. Uh, the fact that he, he did have an opportunity to walk onto the basketball team if he had wanted it, but when Mitch Trubisky left earlier, um, going into the spring of 17, it was incumbent that he get out for spring ball and focus on off season. But uh, he's, a, he's a gifted athlete. Um, you know, we've seen it before with a, a player like Quan Sturdivant, who was a, um, a great quarterback in high school, made the evolution to linebacker. So, um, again, absolutely impossible to draw any conclusions two days into spring ball. But um, um, it will be fun to watch him, and I, I, I certainly think he's got an opportunity. And then the last thing that I'll ask you, this is one of the most interesting things in my opinion, and that's because of the switch from the uh, 4-3 scheme or 4-3 base because we ran so much nickel to now the 3-4 scheme. On the defensive end slash outside linebacker spot, you know, can you give us any sort of – insight into who's going to be with that you know who's going to have a hand in the dirt and who's going to stand up because i've heard some different rumors which include timon fox is going to stand up which i thought timon fox was a guy that kind of fit the three four defensive end uh spot pretty well um you know is there is there anybody that you know maybe we, we wouldn't expect that's doing one or the other um nothing yet anthony and, and I, I think people are going to talk to you much about the change from a 3-4, from a 4-3 to a 3-4. The fact is, you're still going to be a 5 DB set most of the time because that's what gotcha. offenses are doing. Um, I, re- I remember when Larry Fedora first came in and they switched to the 4-2-5 defense and then Gene Chizik came in and they went back to more of a standard 4-3. Well, the fact is, he, 80 or 75 percent of the time they're going to be in a nickel package anyway because offenses are going to have three and four receivers so about that i think it's 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 a matter of semantics now i'm going to be more interested to watch how how they play with the with the defensive backs uh, where does trey morris fit in does he perhaps become that cornerback that we talked about mm-hmm. uh, because he's very gifted athletically we could see him over there but um so it, it's it's going to be fun to watch, um, but, but right now, it, I do want to see come on Fox uh, just lay his ears back and, and be a speed rusher on the outside, though. I, I think he has evolved, and he, he really was handy, handcuffed last year because he had to miss four games, and he never could really develop any momentum as the year went on. One of the la- – I, I, I know I keep getting these questions that pop up as we go along, but – um, you know, Jonathan Smith ends up actually, you know, he's going to miss it, the entirety of spring camp. He's expected to be back with the team in June. But when you right now on, on the interior, who is that guy that you think or maybe that so far you've seen this team turn to as the guy that's probably going to fill in in his role? Well, again, I'll, I'll keep answer, answering all your questions. Hesley, but it's just too early to tell. But Matthew Flint, a freshman last year, is one player that uh, bears watching as, as the year goes on. He was a young man recruited out of Alabama by Tommy Thickpen when Tommy was in Tennessee. When Jeremy Pruitt came in, Flint did not have a spot there, so Tommy was able to, to uh, grab to catch him up and get him to Chapel Hill uh, very quickly. And he had a great spring last year, did not play a lot as a fall, but Tommy has likened him to a, a shorter version of a Bruce Carter, uh, just very savvy, a hard hitter, can run very well. So he's one guy at linebacker that uh, is going to be fun to watch him evolve as his 
spring goes on. Yeah, definitely some encouraging things to hear there. And, uh, Lee, I know that we were asking you some questions that, you know, might be a little bit too early, but I appreciate you fighting through it and uh, giving us some answers and giving us some names to watch here as we go throughout the rest of spring camp and, of course, head towards the spring game on April 13th. So, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, tell the people where they can follow you and, uh, what you know, I know you got some great stuff that you've been writing uh, about uh, spring practice so far and, uh, you know, tell them where they can check out that content as well. Well, go to GoHeels.com. Uh, look under the football page and the Extra Points tab. That'll have an archive of the stories. Uh, um, had, a, had a really fun time writing a piece about Brian Hess and the offseason conditioning program a couple weeks before that. Uh, did a piece on Mac Brown and just how he's evolved and back into his coaching. And um, then uh, follow me on Twitter and Lee Pace Tweet. All right, Lee. Hey, thank you so much, man. We'll uh, definitely have to talk to you down the line. We'll talk to you again maybe sometime in fall camp when you'll have a little more answers to the questions for us. Uh, but, yeah, thank you so much once again, and uh, we'll talk to you later on, okay? Good deal. Have a good day. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. So, Lee Pace of GoHeels.com. Again, we thank Lee for coming by, and, yeah, we have some of those questions. Of course, it is still so early in camp, only two days in, but he gives us some perspective names to keep an eye on. That was the main thing that I was trying to get out of him, and he did such a great job with that. Lee Pace, always a professional. So keep an eye out. We're going to be doing some more interviews as we go throughout spring camp with some of the guys that are around the team and covering the team, and uh, we hope to keep giving you all the great information as quick as we can. Of course, for more, check out the Heel Tough blog. That's www.heeltoughblog.com. That's right. We've got our own website now where you can check out all the latest news, all the latest podcasts, and all the latest offers. We've got an offer page in there that you guys can go ahead and check out for all of the 2020, 2021, and 2022 offers to this point. When they start offering the 2023 class, we'll have that as well. If you guys like the podcast, go ahead and like and subscribe to the podcast. You can do so on Spreaker, iTunes, Google Play, or Google Podcast as they call it now, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn.com, and the TuneIn app. Of course, there's so many other areas that the podcast is at too. Just search Heel Tough Blog on Google or Heel Tough Blog Podcast on Google, and you will be able to find everything that you need. So I want to thank Lee for stopping by. I want to thank you for listening. And as always, go Tor Heels. Ah!